Uh, we are moving swiftly to um, Brian now and the panel. Okay, thank you, Seraphim. So this panel that we have convened um, will uh, go a bit more into depth on the challenges to sharing data linked to academic publications from different perspectives. And so we will have four mini round tables, imagine some tables, <laughs> um, one from the perspective of uh, publishers, publishing houses, one from the perspective of uh, journal editors, uh, one for researchers, and finally uh, one from the perspective of um, data archives, specifically service providers um, from SESTA. So each of the round tables will last um, 20 minutes, and each will start with two to three minute statements uh, from each expert within, uh, within that group, followed by uh, a short discussion with the time remaining um, within uh, the 20 minutes that I will try to animate with questions that are sent in through the chat. Um, from from uh, everyone in the audience, and so um, I encourage um, I encourage everyone who is not in the panel to um, to think of questions and to submit them in in the chat, and then we'll try to pick a few and uh, bring them up for discussion. And also, just to note that some of the experts who will be presenting will have a slide. Um, to present. So I will ask those who do have a slide to um, just share their screens um, themselves. So let's get started with the first of the roundtables. This one composed of experts from um, the publisher point of view. Um, and I'll just go down uh, following the list from uh, our program. Um, our first speaker then um, is Wendel uh, Scholma, who is um, acquisitions editor, but who is also, I think, responsible for um, the research data journal, and uh, she is from Brill. Um, but I would ask Wendel and, and all the other panel speakers if uh, to, to add a few more words about yourselves, if, um, if my um, presentation of you was, uh, was inadequate uh, since it's just a few words. So please, Wendell. Uh, no, I think you introduced me well. I'm an acquisitions editor at Brill uh, based in Leiden, the Netherlands, where I work on uh, several topics, uh, modern history, mostly uh, social history, economic history, and amongst others, I'm looking after the research data journal that I uh, was set up by Peter Dorn and Dans, who is also in this meeting I saw, uh, and is now since this year um, being coordinated together with SESDA, uh, actually. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation. I hope I can stick to two minutes, which is always a very short time to say something. Uh, yeah, so at Brill, uh, we are starting with the implementation of our data sharing policy actually this year. So this is great timing. Uh, to be invited for this meeting. Uh, one of my colleagues is taking part in the uh, STM working group uh, on this topic, uh, which has been very helpful for gathering ideas about how to set up our policy at Brill. And for this year, we are focusing foremost on setting the policy itself and uh, yeah, practical items are still limited. So uh, you can see here, the first two uh, points on my slide are also not necessarily uh, practical challenges that I, I noticed, but they're really getting to the core of the topic. So firstly, um, it's a struggle with the definition of uh, data, uh, specifically for the humanities and social sciences, which is uh, Brill's primary uh, publishing focus. So our authors, for instance, already include full bibliographic references to primary sources and archival material, uh, that they use for their research, uh, and this is what they consider their research data. But uh, should we really call this data, uh, and is this all the data that they have used? Uh, so in the data availability statement that we have prepared now and that we will publish shortly, uh, we will address that we encourage sharing the data or CAPTA uh, that we uh, 
that we mean uh, research assets, uh, data, or captured material with these uh, terms. Uh, but yeah, does this cover everything? Uh, and is CAPTA a preferred term or makes it things just very confusing? We'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, a second point, a second challenge is the lack of guidelines that we see from funders and institutes uh, who more and more uh, are requiring scholars uh, to share their data. And as a publisher, we would, of course, like to facilitate in this. But it's not always specified what they are expecting of their authors. Um, yeah, so this, I think, also uh, not only the authors, but also funders and institutes like this can uh, benefit from CESA that, that were mentioned by Mariana just now. Um, then some other considerations are um, will strict guidelines or even requirements for sharing data slow down our publication processes? and perhaps make it less attractive for authors to publish with us if they can choose to publish somewhere else where they don't need to share their data. Uh, and how much can we expect from authors? Um, I expect that we will have to educate a lot of our authors and journal editors uh, about the basic concepts of what we see as data and how to share it and how to reference to it. Um, and then also a big question is, uh, should the data the linked data be peer reviewed and who will do this? Uh, a possible solution, which I think fits very well with the, the CESDA agenda, is um, that I see that we as a publisher should combine forces with trusted data repositories like the CESDA members, uh, and that we encourage our authors to deposit their data uh, with these depositories. Yeah, as a mid sized publisher, uh, we're not going to set up uh, data sharing platforms like the, the three big publishers that uh, were mentioned before. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity actually to, to work together with data depositories who already have uh, all the expertise. Um, and I think it can be both beneficial for Braille as a publisher, but also for a data depository to work to together. Um, yeah, there are some questions, of course, how to arrange things like this, and then uh, which depositories uh, do you have to uh, deposit your data into for which kind of data? I'll leave it at that. Great. <clears throat> Thanks very much. So our next, um, our next speaker is Caroline Sutton, who is Director of Open Research at Taylor & Francis. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I am director of open research at Taylor and Francis, and I work very closely with a colleague named Matt Cannon, who's my head of open research. Um, and Matt actually has been quite involved with um, the fair sharing group. Uh, he was also involved with um, this repository features to help researchers that was mentioned in the, in the previous um, section and we'll be co-chairing that group moving forward. So that's one of the ways in which we're trying to kind of get engaged with this area. Um, I can mention as well with my background, I also um, am on the board of director of Dryad. So I have a little bit of perspective from the um, service provider perspective. Um, so just to take, I know I had said I might have a slide, but I'm actually dropping my slide. Um, I'll talk a little bit, just mention a few of the challenges that we've seen, and these are a few among a number, as you can imagine. Um, but also some of the opportunities and some of the um, positive things that we see happening. So I think one is we launched a suite of data sharing policies in uh, early 2018. And there was a lot, of course, in getting all of that set up operationally. You can imagine we published over 2,500 journals. So rolling this out as well across all of our journals um, was a bit of work. Um, but this suite moves from a very um, relaxed policy or careful policy of saying we, we highly encourage you to share your data to what we're calling our open and fair data sharing policy, which is that the data must be open and depending on the uh, definition for that subject area, it must be you know, published in a fair way. Um, what we have seen as a challenge, I think, on the humanities and social science side is we have gotten the vast majority of our journals in those areas to adopt the uh, cautious policy of encouraging authors to share their data. But we know, in fact, we don't see a lot of action in terms of actual sharing of data until you implement a more progressive policy. And this is where we are seeing 
a bit more of a challenge on the social science and humanity side in terms of moving our journals on to more progressive policies so that we can actually see some real behavioral changes. Um, some of that comes to the next challenge, I think, which has also been mentioned earlier, and that is there have been concerns raised by editors or the societies we cooperate with, particularly around qualitative data, but also fears that uh, researchers themselves won't know when they can and can't share data and won't know how um, to prepare that data so that it can be shared properly. So that's one of the areas um, that we're seeing is a challenge and that we're having to address and work with folks on. Um, and I think a third thing that I think connects with both of those is that, um, as I'm sure folks on this panel are aware and, and on the call, that you really need to think about how you're going to share your data before you ever collect it. And we've found that the materials and the resources that SESDA have put together about this um, on how do you prepare a data, data management plan are hugely helpful for us when we're engaging with groups. Um, because I think that if people had thought about this at an early stage, and if that culture of thinking about it at an early stage would evolve, um, we probably wouldn't have some of those concerns about qualitative data in the same way because people could present their plan and you would see that yes they you know these people are are doing something in a very very good way um all of that said i think opportunities that we've been recognizing and some of the um, positive things that are happening uh, again i we really appreciated our dialogues with says that we really appreciate the resources that you have available and and we have as well been in touch like brill and looked at opportunities and ways we might be able to engage uh, with the researchers and, and authors, editors and societies that we work with together with you. Um, we're also invited quite a bit to do outreach and sessions on various campuses. And so uh, we see that there's an increase in, in being asked about talking about research data and, and sharing. And that gives us a great opportunity to engage directly on campuses. Again, pushing this early stage and thinking about it. We've also found that we need to think about when we talk about these things, that we need to adjust the language that we're using, because I think much of open science, and as soon as you say that, it's, it's in the terms of STM, and it doesn't necessarily always, um, as I'm sure many people will agree, uh, seem to be couched in the language of the social sciences and humanities. So we've been trying to be very cautious of that and, and conscientious in, in changing how we talk about things. Um, and then finally, just an interesting observation. So uh, Taylor and Francis acquired F1000 last year. And F1000 is a partner for the Open Research Europe uh, platform. And what they're finding is actually the majority of papers that are coming, the submissions coming in there are from the social sciences. And I think that's really interesting because there is a mandatory open data policy and so that also gives me great hope that this is going to uh you know be an indication of, of where things are heading so i look forward to the discussion thank you thank you caroline um our next speaker <clears throat> is martina bean uh, who is editorial director um, of the uh, humanities and social science journal unit um, uh, in the Nature Group. Thank you very much, Brian, for the invitation. I have brought a slide that I would like to share, so let me Excellent. try. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation um, and for the introduction. Um, yeah, my role is the role of a publisher. I'm, I'm coming um, uh, from that editorial side um, and uh, find it really exciting to see in which direction we're now going. Um, within my um, journal publishing career, the, the most remarkable development was open access, where we now stand at 30% of all uh, papers, uh, journal papers published uh, at Springer Nature being open access papers. And in the humanities and social sciences, we're now at 23%, which is uh, really a great figure and uh, shows us where things can go when you uh, really um, convince people that openness um, um, adds a lot of benefits uh, to uh, the research world. So I'm confident that we now get there as well with the um, 
the uh, research data policies. Um, where do we stand at Springer Nature? Well, we uh, started to introduce uh, data policies in 2016 um, in um, a specific part of our business, which is mainly life sciences. Um, and um, in the humanities and social sciences, this is still quite new for us. Uh, we uh, started an initiative uh, to request the data availability statement for all journals uh, in 2020. We're going to implement that in um, the course of this year so it's also a very very timely uh, discussion now uh, for us because we're going to include this also to all HSS journals. We have um, four um, uh, data uh, availability statement types in place that are um, based on the research data alliances data policies um, and um, we're mainly looking into a type three policy. As it was said before, this is the one that is most probably accepted by researchers when we introduce it to all journals. Um, we have to see that for the HSS areas, um, the data availability and the repository, the use of the repositories is not as widespread as for STM. So we need to convince people to really participate in this. And if you want to roll it out to every journal, then it, it has to find a certain degree of, of acceptance and has developed to develop uh, also from there. Um, from my work with authors and editors, mm -hmm. I could, can... Could you briefly say what HSS and STMs are? Oh, sorry. Yes, humanities and social sciences okay. uh, is abbreviated uh, here as HSS, or we call it HSS, sorry. And science, technology, medicine is uh, the other areas um, that um, uh, also uh, comprise um, uh, computer science, uh, engineering, um, and uh, and other areas, um, yeah, that are not not uh, humanities and social sciences. Um, okay, thank thanks. You. Thanks um, for asking for the clarification. Um, speaking about challenges, I see two challenges, two main challenges in the HSS disciplines. One is what Mariana already mentioned, the uh, restrictions to, to sharing uh, non-publicly accessible data. Um, that is, um, that's something that we see for governmental data that we see, for instance, uh, for, for panel data that cannot be made accessible. Uh, but that's where you need also then a variety of, of possibilities for authors to declare what can be shared and what cannot be shared. So that's something to be solved, I guess. The other typical challenge in the HSS disciplines uh, our specialties around the peer review process. Uh, we have often and more often than in, in other disciplines, we have a double blind peer review system. So there are certain needs um, uh, to, um, to uh, keep the, um, um, the author name uh, anonymous and that has some uh, effects on what, what can be shared at what stage of the process. Um, the other point is a, a very long review process that we have in many disciplines uh, in the humanities and social sciences with several rounds of revisions, a process that can take a year, that can take one and a half years, where sometimes uh, research needs to be redone. And when you want people to submit data at an early point in time, that can create difficulties, um, not only for disclosing um, the um, the identity uh, of authors, but also um, because people are working on these data and trying to make the best uh, out of it for their work. And uh, they will be reluctant to share that earlier, much earlier than they can publish their results. Um, I think that's uh, quite understandable. And for that reason, um, they would be reluctant to uh, share data at a very early point in time. And uh, we may have to take this into account when planning our data policies can we move from a policy that is a recommendation only to a mandatory deposit? And if we want a mandatory deposit eventually, then how can we take into account that um, the best time to deposit data for many researchers may be the time when the paper is accepted or close to acceptance. I've listed this among um, the solutions that I'm um, showing on this slide. So we are introducing the type three policy now to all HSS journals in the course of this year. 
with all the options that I mentioned, um, because it's, it's a recommendation, it's not enforced. And uh, we think about what can be done to avoid these problems that I mentioned before, in particular for HSS authors. Um, we, besides this, have a um, specific Spring and Nature data policy uh, given for HSS discipline. So it's the type three policy um, uh, that recommends um, the um, deposit, um, but with more explanations for researchers from the humanities and social sciences, explaining what data is explaining, um, what they can declare uh, in their data availability statement, how to do that with examples for it, to make it very clear what we want to, um, to, to recommend here and suggest to them. Um, the, um, the collaboration that we have with, with other publishers um, through the uh, STM network is very helpful for that because uh, we can uh, indeed see how much um, do we reach together by having similar policies, by having the same degree of enforcement. I think things will go a little bit, uh, sl yeah, more slowly than slowly than in um, in the SDM areas, but um, there is a good chance, like in OA, that we get there uh, with a very good results uh, for full sharing of data in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Um, well, I see that there's quite some activity in the chat, but most of it is comments or some questions that are being answered by um, by others on the same panel. So I think this is good. We can continue like that um, and have sort of parallel <laughs> parallel uh, inter um, interchange. Uh, so um, I think, though, given the time, that we should probably move. Uh, to the next uh, to the next block um, with the editors, if that's okay with everyone, and we should hopefully have some time um, after the break to come back to some of the the questions and to give another opportunity to the uh, to the first panel um, experts to uh, to continue um, on a few points. So then, uh, in that case, let's move to our um, editors. Um, the first uh, that I would like to present is Tanya uh, Vushkovich Yorosh, uh, who is from the University of Zagreb and representing as editor uh, the Croatian Sociological Review. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am here as an editor of the Croatian Sociological Review, but I'm also here as a researcher, and I will start with this perspective, perspective because I think it's most crucial here. So I am a researcher who uses both quantitative and qualitative methods, but I think here it is especially important to emphasize the perspective of a qualitative researcher who is, use, who is using very sensitive data. And, and we mentioned some of these issues, and I think they need to be repeated again. Uh, the sensitive data that is sensitive both personally in terms of that, it goes into deep intimate matters and it's sensitive also politically in terms of that in certain context has a strong political connotations and political implications that this data is used. From this perspective, I would like to emphasize how sensitive qualitative data is produced in a personal relationship of trust with the research participant. And that means that participants participate in this research because they trust the researcher, that they trust me, that I will not misuse, misrepresent, or misinterpret the data, and that I will expect my responsibility to them. And this is, I think, what's really at stake here. When we are talking about depositing the data, the quality of data into research depositories, we have to remember two things. One is that anonymization without decontextualization is often not sufficient. But if you decontextualize the data, it's, you are making it invalid for future interpretations. So what do I mean by this? So the, the most obvious level of anonymization for quality data, if you remove the names, if you remove the, all the obvious identifiers, still cannot 
really remove the recognizability of data, the stories that are uh, recognizable and identifiable because they are so deeply contextual. And this is not a problem only because uh, it can create hurt to the participants, their families, etc. But this can cause a real political misuse of data in certain contexts. I mean, for example, I'm, do, I'm working with families and sexuality, so I can see many ways in, in, in which the data I use, if not the console, like the control choice can be actually uh, used to cause targeted harm. So what I would expect my authors to do, and what I also do in publications, is to present the data in ways that some contextual factors are missing or muddled or presented in such a way that they are not easily identifiable. At the same time, I'm as an analyst and in the whole process of review process, the data uh, with the applications, you do have as a researcher access data and you are using that to interpret, but you just cannot present it. Uh, and giving the access to data without the contextualization it's done, it actually makes it invalid for future interpretations, it's just problematic epistemologically. So what is the problem I want to emphasize here? So depositing sensitive quality data into depositories, just anonymized, but not the the like sorry, <laughs> is ethically and morally problematic. But uh, if you do uh, do it like that in order to protect the data, to protect participants. Then you make the imputation based on this data impossible for future researchers who would like to uh, reuse it. So are there any solutions to this? And I, I think the issue is very difficult to, 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 to resolve with the current solutions. And current solutions are usually in terms of level of access, right? You have different levels of access to the relative data in uh, in depositories, because the access is not where you stop. The access is where you start. You have to have accountability also to the final product that comes out of this data. This is something that that is the, the key here. Where do we stop with accountability of those who come? to use the, the research data after the process has stopped, after the original researchers are removed from the process. And I think that it's important to remember that responsibility to the research participants must always trump the an immediate and unrestricted, unrestricted use of data, no matter that is very nice in principle. And I am all for that. That's fair principles are something that we all should strive. But I'm very, very scared whenever I hear, and I heard it here two, two times, the, the phrase mandatory deposit. This is a very dangerous thing to provide as a one fit all solution. We as members of academic communities, we as uh, researchers, we as funders and evaluators, editors, we have to be careful not to impose such requirements blindly, not to impose the principles that are good, good in general, but cannot always be used without trumping our other responsibilities. And we must not sanction those who cannot and must not, or sometimes must not provide the data uh, to, to uh, quality depositories and then also uh, to provide them fully to journals. I think there are some ways around it. Do you, you kind of ha can have the levels of access that are providable to uh, reviewers, to the editors, things like that. This it can all it all can be included into the ways of thinking to, to the solutions. But just we have to not to just see our final goal to be a mandatory requirement to have the open access for all because this is just not good idea all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, our next speaker is uh, Alex uh, Afuxanidis. Um, and uh, please, I remind, uh, remind our panelists to try to keep the time to a few minutes because uh, we're, we're running behind a bit. Thank you. 
Hello from Athens. Um, Actually, um, I, yeah, excuse me, I forgot to say something about you, but maybe you can, I leave I can it to you it. to say it yourself. I can do it in uh, <laughs> 20 seconds. Well, I'm a, actually, I'm a political sociologist, political scientist, dealt a lot with issues which have to do with civil society. Right now, and over the past few years, I've happened to have the opportunity to be chief editor of the Greek Review of Social Research, which is the biggest social sciences journal right now in Greece. Only last year, we had about 80,000 downloads and views. And uh, at the same time, as it happens, and this is quite interesting, I'm uh, vice chairman of the Greek um, um, research institution, HFRI. Uh, this is a big institution, which uh, funding institutions for project research. And um, so I'd like to combine these um, perspectives in what I'm going to say, and I'm going to try to be very fast, as I found myself to be in agreement with uh, a lot of the issues that were um, mentioned earlier by the previous three, four speakers. A lot of these things are, um, a lot of the challenges that they identified are also challenges for us. So um, I think that very quickly, just to say this, that um, it's, I think it's pretty strange actually that uh, we actually deposit a lot of our data in uh, open repositories, individually and collectively, namely social media, and we have difficulty in depositing our data from our research. Um, and this is like a contradiction in terms. So in terms of the social sciences, I would, I would agree with the previous speaker who said that um, there's a difficulty in um, uh, data for social sciences is quite different than for applied science. Um, in our journal, we do not have a precise policy of asking for uh, raw data to be, uh, uh, to be put in a repository. But um, the question still remains open for social scientists and especially for qualitative researchers as to what uh, such data consists of. So I think that this is a multidimensional issue. And I don't think that there's one solution uh, for all sizes, one solution that uh, does not fit everyone. Um, a second point that I would like to, um, a second challenge that I would like to mention uh, regards the issue of costs and human resources. And I think it's pretty different to compare, for example, uh, mid, middle income or low income countries to other nations who are uh, of higher income. And there, so there are differences in terms of uh, infrastructure and how you know, things are set up in various countries, but there are also differences across and amongst institutions. So there's an institutional indi uh, individual researcher level, institutional level, and also a, a kind of national country level uh, um, uh, with respect to all these things. Um, from my experience, most authors are in favor of um, data upon request process. And I think that this is for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is that it's easier to actually state that instead of dealing with organizing the data to be put in a repository. But there's also a, a kind of academic cultural issue, which maybe we should discuss in a, another meeting. Um, so in addition to that, a lot of people, and I see that from our experience here in Greece and in our institution, a lot of people do not really understand or know repositories. For example, if you ask them to, to do this in a, in a repository such as the Nordo, they don't, they don't really know how to do it. So they, there has to be a kind of educational process behind all this in order to pick up some steam. So the question of which repository and why is uh, really important. So there are issues with provisions of a, a, a kind of easy access infrastructure by institutions, um, academic institutions or other. And the, behind that, as I said earlier, is the economics, the costs of the whole thing. Um, for example, you need some human resources in order to handle it, which maybe small publishers or small institutions do not have. Another point, that, another challenge that I found uh, is related to the, uh, um, the issue of uh, ethics and ethical committees and whether they understand um, uh, how this data should be handled. So, uh, for example, you may have, uh, it may be rather unclear in some social science research, such as research with uh, regards to health topics or the so, you know, social policy topics, etc. So there is also a, a, a challenge with, which has to do with clarity, clarity by publishers, um, commercial publishers and other publishers such as us, who are, we are no commercial publisher. Um, and um, uh, clarity meaning uh, issues which have to do with uh, possibly uh, uh, copyright issues, etc. So 
what what I have seen in my experience is that there is an increasingly large number of uh, of publications, very large number of publications, many many journals, and a lot of people can publish quite easily the research. But that uh, exponential growth of publication has not been followed by an exponential growth of openness. So you have a very small number of data uh, deposits. So what the precise some of the reasons and the challenges have been mentioned before, but precisely in terms of very analytically understanding what are the reasons as to why there's such a small number of data deposited, um, it, I think requires a lot of extensive and longitudinal research. Uh, and some of the questions which um, uh, I have in my mind are um, the following. One of these is how data is to be, with respect to the social sciences, of course, always. One of these questions has to do with how data is to be presented and how much time does a researcher need to do that, because as you know, we don't, as researchers, we don't have time for all these things. Possibly, and I'm bringing in my experience from project funding institutions, possibly big institutions like the EU or other institutions, national institutions which fund a big, pro, a big or small projects, could dedicate some um, uh, uh, funding to this particular topic of organizing data in order to be put in open, de open depositories, etc. Otherwise, why should one do it exactly? Um, there's also an issue of uh, who understands, pre who precisely understands the idea of raw data and what exactly that means for the social sciences. So overall, I would say that there were some of the questions that the fellow colleagues are mentioning is why should we do it if there is no recognition, no validation of this type of work because it's extra work. If there's no recognition or validation of this work or indeed funding for this type of work, why should we do it? Why exactly should we do it? Since if we publish in any case, we disseminate research and one researcher learns from another through publication. Um, so um, I think that I covered everything. I don't want to take much more of your time. And thank you very much for the invitation. OK, thank you. I think what we're seeing is that there's quite a lot to say <laughs> from different perspectives. Um, let's keep going then. Um, the next speaker is um, Raphael Lalive, who is a professor of economics at the University of Lausanne and um, editor of the Swiss Journal of Economics and Statistics in Switzerland. Uh, yes, so um, thank you. I'm here. So this journal is active in, uh, accepts articles in economics. And so in that sense, it's a slightly different part of the social sciences. Um, I'm managing this for a few years and we're working together with Springer. So <laughs> Martina Bean's st staff is, is, is working with us. She has a very good editor that we talked to and we joined Springer Open in 2018. And so one thing I would like to um, emphasize here is that in, in our view, having uh, open access for articles was a huge improvement on the visibility of the articles we publish. And so I'm convinced that in fact, open access or sharing of data that we discuss here, it's a different topic, will also have a huge benefit on um, the visibility and also on transparency, on, on quality. So I'm totally convinced of that. And, um, I, it, and, and basically I think it's important to have now today basically an open discussion of the challenges. And I think there, there are really many. I'm learning from everybody who's talking today. So in my view, there are three, uh, they're not unique. Uh, I, we've heard them before, but I just want to just uh, put them on the table. To me, the one, one challenge is scientific. So at which stage do we need to see the data to make a good decision? Um, that was a question that was raised. Um, I think the earlier, the better. So reviewers should have access. But then the second one is that we cannot expect this from everyone. So the, here I rejoin the first statement in this session, not every data is equal. So when we talk about data sharing, this is inspired a lot by STEM research where people have lab data, maybe they have mice. So the mice don't care whether their data is shared. We are, we're talking about humans here. And so in, 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 in economics, there, there's, there's quite a lot of proprietary data. And again, there are solutions. I think self-declaration of, of authors would be a very good way to go. But then a self-declaration is maybe not enough. We need to also maybe ask uh, researchers 
to spell out exactly how they obtained this proprietary data so that if somebody wants to work on the topic, they can have um, at least information. And then the, the technical part, I think that one seems really you know, easy and feasible. I, I see SESTA and I see, for instance, in Switzerland, Swiss U base, those are very good archiving products. And what I wish, you know, in, in, in talking to Martina Bean, is that that you know that there, there would be some close integration with these um, open and and fair and transparent um, uh, archiving services with uh, the the backbone that we use when we publish with you, which is great, you know, with uh, the open um, access um, infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Um, our last speaker in this session is Kai Schnapp who is from the University of Hamburg and also editor of the German Political Science Quarterly. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I tried to, to make it brief. Um, we at uh, German Political Science Quarterly follow a rather strict uh, open data policy since uh, quite some time, at least for uh, large and quantitative uh, data. So we want our authors uh, to make their data uh, available and since recently tried to follow the American Journal of Political Science regulation, who have an 11 page uh, document on how to share data for quantitative, for qualitative, and that's very differentiated for lots of situations that we've been talking about here, especially there's a special section on exceptions that need to define. So what are the challenges? I think uh, one of the challenges uh, you really face is uh, to find uh, a, 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 an appropriate repository that is reliable over time, that is technically up to date and pre-ordering things, uh, files, etc. And, uh, and uh, in terms of somebody being uh, on the European continent, uh, finding a data repository uh, that is in line with uh, European data protection law, copyright law, etc. So we started leaving data on the website of our publisher quite some years ago, and that was uh, Nomos then and is Springer since uh, two years. Uh, but that's just talking about switching publishers. That's not really reliable. So uh, that, that is not the good thing to do. Then we looked into Harvard Dataverse uh, because it's technically fine. Uh, all the big political science journals are there, so you're in good company but uh, then European data protection law and copyright law becomes a problem. Hence, uh, we moved rather recently to Gaze's Statorium, or we are still about to move because I'm very slow, Jonas knows it. Um, and um, we feel that this is, uh, at least for us in the moment, the perfect solution to be with uh, a place like that. And in the first presentations, I was already asking myself, whether GESES and Datorium is one of those CESDA service providers, that would be great because then we are already there. So, uh, but um, in addition to finding a good repository, uh, one of the large problems, big problems, of course, is making sure data and code in the repository are tried and tested. That can not usually be done by the journal. Uh, and for us, the solution also is GESES Datorium, who do at least quite some of the technical trying and testing. And we are still discussing how to integrate uh, the stuff in the review and at what time to actually ask authors um, to put their data there. Of course, a big problem is non-standardized data from hermeneutic research traditions. And there also is a very good, uh, at least I think, uh, guideline in what the American Journal of Political Science does. They say, if you cannot share the data, and there may be good reasons for that, at least uh, share extensive uh, documentation on method and, and procedure, on uh, questionnaires, everything that you did to collect the data, and uh, at least supply the data for review to the editorial board. So talking about restricted solutions. And of course, again, the ex exception uh, rules applies. Another challenge to journals still is, shouldn't be uh, in the early 20s of the uh, 21st century, but getting authors to really supply well-documented data. It's not so difficult to get data at all, but to really get well-documented data that other people can read, that other people can use, uh, still is a problem. And I think we need uh, infrastructural solutions like uh, Datorium that already has some predefined structures uh, so a common framework uh, supported by somebody like CESDA 
and maybe developed in discussion with journals, with uh, researchers. That's something that uh, we actually need. And I, I stop at that. Thanks. Thanks very much uh, uh, to you and to all of the um, experts from this uh, group of editors. Um, a lot of very insightful um, ideas there. Let's move directly though to the next one because we are about 10 minutes behind. Um, but I see at the same time a lot of really good uh, uh, exchange in the chat going on. So let's keep that going. Um, let's pass then to our group of researchers. Um, also recognizing that um, um, many of the panelists who have already spoken also have a hat um, as a researcher, but um, now we get a researcher perspective, perhaps also mixed um, with some other perspectives, um, but let's see. Um, so our first speaker in this group is uh, Simon Heuberger, who is a research scientist at TU München. Um, one second. Um, and a replicator for political analysis. Yes, thanks, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me. This is a really cool uh, panel to see so many different perspectives. I'm very much going to be talking about the shared experiences here. So um, it, it contacts neatly to what Kai was saying about AJPS. I work for political analysis, and we get a lot of um, quantitative data and quantitative analyses, which means we need to run those. And in recent uh, months and years, uh, these have gotten just bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that when we use data repositories where we download them and then run them ourselves, it's more and more long, longer feasible uh, because these are just too heavy to run and would run months on a normal laptop, for instance. So what we've um, moved to is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, uh, are called Docker containers uh, in the web where it's a self-contained capsule where you can run everywhere. Researchers can upload their entire data, uh, plus the program they need to run it, et cetera. And anyone who visits the website can click on run and the material reproduces. Now, as we've done that um, from, a, from obviously the data sharing perspectives, there have been some challenges, most, mostly with data that is semi or completely private in the sense that they are not allowed to share it because then this whole endeavor kind of falls flat. Um, now, for us, it doesn't happen too much um, because we get a lot of simulations and Bayesian analyses and all those, which, which don't have identifying um, features. But sometimes we do get survey data or, uh, yeah, mostly surveys that are proprietary, and then this approach doesn't really work. Uh, so for us, that's a, that's a challenge uh, because we would like to make everything as transparent as possible. That's the whole idea, obviously. But running them in this um, container form is not possible if you can't have the data. So we're basically back um, to square one. But this whole point for us originated in the fact that the, uh, the data size and the, the computing power required uh, to run things has exploded over the last year or two which is why we switched um, to such an online replication um, form. And I would be, uh, yeah, I'm generally interested in reading all the comments to how other social science journals who probably have less quant data deal with this. Um, yeah, so, so for us from a data sharing point, our approach does not work when the data is proprietary, which kind of puts us back to the beginning, sadly. Okay, thank you. Next, we have uh, Kostas Geminis, who is a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies. Um, so I just need to um, share this slide. I, I hope you can see uh, what I'm sharing. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, uh, just a few words from uh, my experience as, a, as someone who um, uh, publishes articles and uh, tries uh, uh, as much as possible to share all the data and, you know, replication material, but also as a person who is interested in, in, in data and replication and is trying to access other colleagues' um, uh, data and replication material. Um, there are incentives. I just have a few bullet points. There are incentives 
uh, from um, researchers to withhold data, uh, either for pea hacking because they're just doing something, you know, fishing for statistical significance or they're doing, you know, something, you know, a little bit dodgy so they don't want other people to know, or they might have like this kind of proprietary data that they try to get like as many publications out of the data as possible by being a co-author because they're providing the data, right? So this is also uh, something that I've encountered. There are people who become co-authors in multiple papers just because they hold on, on onto a data set which they give to others to write papers. So for those people, there is an incentive not to get the data public because if the data is public, then everybody can access it. So, uh, you know, they lose uh, their ability to become co-authors in multiple papers by just giving uh, uh, um, uh, the data to, to colleagues. So um, uh, journals uh, have been trying uh, more increasingly lately to make uh, data accessible, like having like these open research budgets, which is like something uh, like encouraging people to, to get um, um, uh, the data public and um, uh, very nicely ties with uh, 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 the, the perspective from political analysis where they have replicators, some journals like American Journal of Political Science, it was also mentioned previously, uh, PSRM uh, in, in Europe, they have like this thing where you have to make your data um, uh, public and there, there is someone who, who replicates everything from the journal and makes sure that you know everything's in order. Um, just the practice of having a data availability statement, uh, it's not sufficient. Um, you know, researchers will, will find the ways around that. They will say, hey, you know, my data is proprietary. Uh, I cannot share it. You know, uh, my cat ate the data, you know. You know, I, I mean, they come up with all sorts of excuses. So just to have like a data availability statement is not going to do anything. Uh, so, um, yeah, we probably need uh, something which is maybe if not like compulsory but you know having like more of an encouragement like this open research badge thing i think that's a good thing and uh yeah so uh my um um, um pers perspective is like we um well not we i think it's, it should be the publishers that should they should have more stringent and consistent practices uh, i've come across instances where there are journals that uh, say all data but must be made uh, uh, publicly accessible because that's the policy of the journal. It's an open access journal, we're promoting this. And still researchers will find ways to um, pretend that the data is uh, um, um, uh, accessible, but then you will need a password. So you'll need to contact them to give you a password and then one just give it to you. So, um, so I don't think it's us researchers that we have to sort of um, manage through all of that, like a red tape. It should be the, the journals and the publishers that say, hey, you know, if it's an open access journal and the data needs to be open access, they should hire a person who um, makes sure that this is actually the case and not just like, you know, me having to complain to the journal uh, saying, hey, you know, that article, you know, uh, I try to access the replication material and they will just not send it to me. You know, they make all sorts of excuses and it's your policy that it's open and it should be open. So, uh, yeah, that, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas. Um, next, we have uh, Holger Doering uh, from the University of Bremen and uh, I think at the same time, or soon to be the same time, uh, cases, uh, data services. Olga, please. Yeah, Brian, thanks for the introduction. So I will start at Gezes in August. Um, so, but Seraphine and I agreed um, to list me already as Gezes um, there um, too. So I'm sharing my screen um, too. So, um, and I can connect, I also try um, to be brief. And I can connect um, directly to what Simon Heiberger um, said previously because I went through the replication process um, at political analysis. I should say in general that I don't fit well in the researcher category because I have such a data profile as a researcher um, that I have my decent record of research publications, um, but I have also worked a lot on um, data within political science over the last 15 years. 
And overall, I have to say, I mean, it's an amazing development. Like 10 years ago, I couldn't publish my data anywhere. No one was interested in it. It's widely cited by now, but no journal was interested in it because it was not considered to be part of the research process or at least of what we publish and what we value. Um, whereas now, particularly over the last five years, I think it has just been an amazing um, development. So, um, but since I'm interested also in open source software and wider perspectives on data, kind of, I think kind of data availability, we have addressed a lot of the issues. Um, what I see more where we are not fully yet um, is so, and I um, probably yeah, I switch to the good things at first. So what is good? So um, data is visible, there's awareness, and I think we have an increasingly reliable um, infrastructure and the journals can draw on, that researchers can draw on, and it has been discussed here. I think what is um, where we haven't moved up with the kind of technical demands um, and also with the technical opportunities is what is uh, what I would call a modern standards and best practices. So I see that sometimes used in the R community as tidy data. So I think as social scientists, we are good kind of, we have a kind of one spreadsheet style of data with a code book and it is documented. But often the code book I and mean, also the replication material, it's more kind of tailored for one particular article. So in, in general, so I think I have very good and high skills with data. With methods, um, kind of advanced methods are often a challenge um, to me. So I'm interested in the replication material, um, but I often see it's not communicated well. So it relies on packages that are opaque or quickly outdated. There's no detailed commenting, so I cannot really learn from the data and from the methods um, that are applied to it. And I see that sometimes um, with data too. So that is tailored for a particular research paper. Um, and I think we can do a better job um, also in the review process um, of looking at the data, how much it adds kind of to an ecosystem, how it interfaces with other data. So and I have found kind of reading the um, Christensen book on um, open um, open science um, very inspiring. I think um, if you look at data from an open science perspective, we can do a, a better job um, looking more broadly into it. So that's my input, Brian. Thanks. Okay, very good. Um, well, we're we're getting back to our schedule, uh, and uh, in the interest of. Uh, saving some time for a break uh, in about 18 minutes. Uh, let's move on. There's still, I see quite a lot going on in the chat. Uh, I've been trying to pay attention to the speakers, so I haven't really followed the discussions, but um, uh, glancing at them, they look pretty interesting. Let's move then to our last session from the perspective of the SESTA service providers um, and uh, data archives. So our first um, speaker uh, is Ilse uh, Latze, uh, who is a research data advisor at the SND, the Swedish National Data Service. Ilse? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm a representing provider, a trusted servants in uh, supporting social science researchers uh, in uh, archiving their data and making the data uh, reusable. Uh, well, even though we've classically been working with finished, so to say, data sets, uh, archiving um, data from the accomplished research projects. Uh, recently, I think the last five years, it's been more and more increasing uh, the um, amount of um, data related to publications has been uh, also increasing. And uh, what we've been doing is we've been taking an adaptive and reactive approach and trying to serve the needs of the researchers. Um, basically, the day, uh, they've been contacting us, uh, what, how, how should we do, what should we do? The, um, the, 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 uh, we want to publish this, this article, but the editor or the publisher wants us to deliver data in this or that way. And then we've tried to find a way how to help them. So um, 
basically, uh, this is the position we've been having. We haven't really had much of a proactive contact with publishers and editors, and I see that it might perhaps have been a good thing to do. The challenges, though, from uh, the pers perspective of working with researchers, uh, the big challenge, well, we are, um, the, the, the biggest challenge is actually how to balance the benefits that uh, SND as a trusted domain specific repository could provide into, in making the data set fair, well documented, reusable, uh, and the actual uh, situation the researcher is in. As the editor, as somebody in the editor panel said already, um, it takes time today to, uh, to prepare a publication. And usually when the publication is in the final stage, Usually researchers don't have time and don't have money and don't have resources to put onto nice um, um, data publication. So even though we have a lot to offer, we often meet the situation that the data set is like uh, submitted uh, uh, with a request to process and cur curate it like yesterday. So this is kind of the problem we, we are facing. And um, I don't really know, but one of the solutions might be a clear statement on the in, in the policies about the uh, recommended repositories or something like this. So to make the choice for the researchers easier, that they don't have to like um, choose between a repository with higher requirements and higher quality and perhaps uh, the repository where you can get a DUI or other kind of pers persistent identifier for your data with three clicks, but perhaps the data is not so easy to find the later. And the other issue we are facing is, uh, or we have been discussing is that as a trusted uh, repository, uh, we would like to aim for the highest quality of documentation and preservation of the data linked to publications. And even though our exp experience lies also with uh, um, working with, uh, with, so to say, project data, accomplished project, data coming from accomplished projects. So the question is, um, we have a separate workflow now for the data related link to publications. It's developed uh, completely as a response to the data policies and researchers' needs. Um, and we are wondering, are we doing it right? What do actually, what should we do and how we should, uh, how we could uh, achieve the, the best for the replication data sets, the best quality for the replication data sets we're working with. So sorry for, it was too long, but uh, I, th I hope the point is clear. Thanks, Ilse. No, it's fine. Um, let's go then to um, Christina Magda, who is data collections development manager at the UK Data Archive, UK Data Service. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Brian. Short info about me for context, trying to keep it in the three minutes. I manage the UK Data Service data collections development and research data management teams based at the UK Data Archive. And I also lead the RDM portfolio with a particular focus on ensuring the successful implementation of the UKRI research data policy for the Economic and Social Research Centre. Now, EFRC was actually the first funding body in the UK to mandate data sharing. And it's, it's actually really encouraging to hear journal editors arguing the need of data management plans uh, in data collections. And I will note here, the mandate to share the data is when this is both possible. Both us and the funding bodies appreciate there are circumstances where data cannot be shared, and we are here to guide and help researchers throughout, throughout the journey. It is a pleasure to be here and hear all these common and similar concerns from researchers to publishers um, and to data archives. I would like to say that we are quite lucky in the perspective that the main challenges when they come to uh, sensitive and potential disclosive data are managed through a robust and trusted governance framework. At the UK Data Service, we implement the five safe frameworks, which allows for the ethical and legal sharing of this data, of course, consent permitting. Uh, but we also allow for external peer, peer reviews via our self-deposit repository we share. However, the challenge we are now facing more and more often is the data linked to publication that is the derived data from other published sources 
when these data are published under a free to adapt and distribute license like the Creative Commons or the Open Government License, there are no issues. However, given the detailed data from governmental surveys and longitudinal studies must be made available under more restrictive license agreement due to that disclosure risk, if not because we don't want to make that data more openly available, this is where we face the problems, how do we share that data? And of course, the legal constraints and the proprietary obligations. Data owners do not have, the original data owners do not have the resources of maintaining these derived products throughout the time. In the case where specific observations have to be removed under the right to be forgotten, or when, especially with longitudinal data, when more data is published and some confidentiality concerns can arise from previously published data and specific variables need to be recoded or even dropped sometimes. But of course, with the pressure, per, apologies, with the pressure for research transparency and reproducibility high on the research agenda, with journals asking for the data to be made available, we had to take some practical steps in ensuring that no data is lost. The solution we found is sharing the code. This solves the challenges faced and it's also more reproducibility friendly. And I'm saying more reproducibility friendly because by providing the code, any secondary user can actually check that code and see if it's feasible to use in their research and if it, if it is actually accurate as well. All the UK data service holdings are made available with a persistent identifier, a DOI, and this is why we always argue in any code that is shared, the citation with the DOI must be shared to allow reproducibility. We do allow the versioning of the data collection and access to pre previous versions is actually possible, but this is only via request to ensure that the obsolete versions are not made available by accident and also that the data owner allows that. I, we appreciate sharing of the code is not a solution for everything. Um, so for example, when derived products are created by manual coding, we actually facilitate negotiations with original data owners in order to ensure that this data is not lost and can be shared for uh, linkage to publications. We just had a recent example where a researcher um, research team has used a 1958 National Child Development Study and coded manually approximately 5,000 essays for various psychosocial characteristics. What we've done is to actually have a discussion with the original data creator, and they have agreed to collaborate with that specific research team to ensure that the data are made available for secondary use. Now, to conclude, we understand sharing of the code might not be the best solution for all cases. And another example besides manual coding is derived data created from sources which are not version, um, especially sources that are made available via bespoke data sharing agreement. But in most instances, sharing the code is the most straightforward way to ensure no data is lost and reproducibility is possible. It also encourages sharing of the original data under a clear licensing framework with persistent identifier version implementation and also encourages fair data. Yes, a consultation with journal editors will be extremely beneficial in ensuring sharing of the code is considered the best practice in such circumstances. And I will end here. I think I'm over my time, but thank you ever so much for having me once again. Thanks very much, Christina. Uh, well, our last presenter, or last but, but not least, is Peter Dorn, who is scientific advisor uh, at DOMS, Data Archiving and Network Services in the Netherlands. Peter? Thank you, Brian. Instead of sharing my screen, I created a small Google Doc with the, uh, the, the, the kernel of my presentation and I provided the link in the chat. So if you care to look, you can go there and there's a couple of links there for further information as well. Um, DOMS started research on data availability policies uh, by journals in the humanities and social sciences back in 2012. Back then, our aims were to archive the data in, uh, on which uh, journal articles uh, were based, uh, to connect data better to publications, to publish data more attractively than in the usual uh, data catalog that we service providers uh, usually uh, uh, provide. Um, and to provide context and to present the potential for, re for reuse better than in, this, in, in the usual data catalog. And last but not least, to give researchers who share data additional credit via data publications. 
But back then, we got a very low response and very low interest by editors of a selection of journals that we approached. And looking at the SESTA survey, it seems that this has improved by now considerably, which is a very good thing. Um, at the time, um, I, I mean, back again in the early 19, uh, 2010s, we saw the start of several data journals, mainly in the natural sciences. And we then decided to start a data journal in the humanities and social sciences in collaboration with Brill. Uh, Wendel uh, also mentioned that in her, he, she was, I think, the very first uh, uh, speaker uh, in this row, and, and, and I'm the very last, so that is, that is nice. And which is the, uh, now the responsibility of SESDA since the start of this year. The Research Data Journal for the Humanities and the Social Sciences, uh, it is called, and, you, and I provide a link if you care to look uh, for more, more information. Um, at DANS, we are still very much interested in a better presentation of data, for which we set up an exhibit of data sets, which is connected to the research data journal, and which also can be used by data archives, such as our own uh, at DANS. And I also provide the link there in the, in the Google Doc. Uh, finally, um, I would like to say that um, uh, DANS also serves as a long-term preservation archive for the data repository of one of the world's biggest uh, publishers, uh, although there is another very big one here as well, uh, but I now mean uh, Elsevier's uh, Mendeley data. And uh, uh, also we, I provide a link there, but if you go to the DANS archive, you can find those data also archived at DANS. That's what I would like to say very briefly here. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all of the uh, experts who um, shared their, their thoughts uh, and perspectives during this panel this afternoon. I don't know about you, but I'm quite saturated now <laughs> um, after all that has been uh, put on the table. Um, so in, in, in that case, I would suggest that, uh, well, maybe I can turn it back to Seraphim, um, but hoping that he's going to allow us uh, a break. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, Brian. And thanks to everyone for contributing your thoughts and your reflections, as well as uh, the incredible amount of um, discussion happening in the chat. Mm -hmm.